sand <laughs> at Bondi Beach <laughs> in regard to denial, which I haven't heard at was Bondi coming Beach at today. Bondi today. So, really? so uh, I talked to a few other people at the restaurant and they didn't heard it, hadn't heard of it either. But yes, so there's interesting when there's lots of things happening that you don't know, don't know about. So, how many people did they have? I didn't, oh, I don't know, because yeah. I never actually got, I sent her a text, but yeah. I sort of got a roundabout message from the Institute that she was looking for a quote, so I sent her a quote by a text, but I never, she never got back to me, so phone rings in the middle. I suspect I missed the window of opportunity, sadly, because I, uh, yeah, so those are some of the books that, about all of these talk about denial. The one on the left, uh, I think all of them, the first two are, uh, some of them are on the table, and that's the one that's coming out, demystifying sustainability uh, next year. So, denial is my obligatory joke. Denial, not just a river in Africa. Uh, indeed, it's actually a major problem in the human psyche, as we shall see. So the short answer to the question is uh, as to when the denial dam's going to break is, well, we don't know, but, <laughs> Um, how many people predicted the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fall of the Berlin Wall one year out from when it actually happened? Essentially, nobody. Nobody thought it was going to happen. Um, so in other words, we're all very worried about tipping points at climate change, but there's other tipping points. And as Paul Ehrlich has noted, when the time is right, society can be transformed virtually overnight. So in other words, if there are thresholds in human behaviour, when cultural evolution moves very rapidly. And we generally don't know, we can see them in hindsight and make out how obvious they were in hindsight, but we really can't predict them. So, uh, and as many people point out, you know, it's darkest before the dawn. <laughs> denial is often greatest before the denial dam bursts. Uh, recently at the Fenner Conference on the Environment, some of you may have heard of Robert Costanza, who's done a lot of work uh, in environmental science and uh, ecological economics over many years. He's the one who actually came up uh, working with very many colleagues, but working out what was the dollar cost of nature, what does nature do in, uh, for humans every year until for free, in terms of if we had to pay for what it did, where he basically came out that it, uh, he's actually done it over about 20 years, different studies, and basically they all come out saying it's about twice the the GDP of the whole world. So he's pointing out that, uh, but uh, his comment to me was, is he thought we were actually getting close to the tipping point. And I'm not just saying that to do a pep talk, <laughs> uh, but uh, because it is a reality that we really don't know, and we may be closer to things suddenly tipping over uh, than we think. So for instance, we did actually act on acid rain. I mean, I've been, environmentalists, activists, and scientists for 40 years now. And uh, I, mean, I can remember when acid rain was uh, as much of a concern, almost, as climate change is now. Um, but of course, we actually did develop a trading scheme for sulfur, the first uh, trading scheme, which uh, was quite effective, so that acid rain, it's not, not gone away by any means, especially since China's opening a coal-fired power station every eight days. But uh, it has much improved, and many areas that were degraded uh, then are now starting to recover. Similarly, everyone knows a hole in the ozone layer. Uh, the smoking gun, as it was called, with ozone decreasing as chlorine, chlorine monoxide increased. Uh, and the interesting thing, actually, about the research that's discovered that is it was actually knocked back to get an official grant. Originally, he had to get his funding from somewhere else that actually found out what was happening with the ozone layer, but we actually did create the Montreal Protocol and the ozone hole. Again, it's not gone away, but it is closing. So, uh, and you can see the graph there of the reduction of ozone depleting substances is almost down uh, to zero. So again, while I'm gonna talk about denial, and it's a very worrying trait in humanity, it's not as if we can't actually accept uh, in the end that we have problems and do things about it. And when we actually get past the denial dam, we actually are a creative and imaginative species and we can actually move uh, fairly quickly to solutions. Yes. So we can act on climate change also, of course. Uh, 
Um, but let's just take a step back uh, and uh, ask, what is it that we deny? I thought I was looking for a good wow. stepping off here. Good. Think about it. Uh, do we just, as a society, deny the problem of climate change? And uh, I suggest there's at least four elephants in the room. I'm about to add a fifth one after this. Uh, one, that on a finite planet, you can't just keep increasing your population. You can't keep increasing your consumption. You can't keep growing your economy forever. And of course, there's climate change, which we're, you're mainly concerned about as a group. But as an environmental scientist, a lot of environmental scientists spend time arguing about which is the biggest elephant, which is the most dangerous. And my point is, uh, whatever elephant sits on you, <laughs> you're going to be have real problems. So uh, they're all dangerous and they all have to be seen. And of course, I'm going to add a fifth one, which is extinction, of course. Mm. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was actually very conservative when it estimated that extinction rates were a thousand times the normal level. Uh, Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, who's really the father of the term biodiversity, his estimate in 2003 was without action we'd be losing, well, if we kept going the same way, growing forever, by the end of this century, we'd lose uh, half the world species. Uh, Peter Raven, um, who's one of the other key biodiversity experts in the world that I actually got to meet a few years ago when he was in Sydney, he's done a recent study and sadly he puts the figure at two thirds. So we're in the, the sixth mass, great mass extinction of the last 600 million years. It's now underway. It's not a, it's not a comet like the one they've just landed on this morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's, I must admit, I wondered whether they thought they gave it a little bit of a nudge. <laughs> they might put it on a different course and we might, we might have to worry about <laughs> a comet extinction again. But um, it's been... questions along the way? Uh, yeah, why not? Well, uh, is it true that I read somewhere that the mammalian species in Australia was down uh, to half what it was? We've got the worst mammal extinction in the world, mm -hmm. yes. Australia, Australia is one of the mega extinction. Uh, so if we were going to get a medal for extinction, yeah, Australia would get one. Uh, and it's still going on. We, we, that's why we're worried there could be a further cascade of extinctions, particularly with the, the small to well, with the mid-range marsupials are still at risk from cats and, cats and foxes in particular. So, I mean, if you're looking at the half to two-thirds of life going extinct, and as Sule, uh, Michael Sule and Wilcox noted, death is one thing and the end to birth is something else because you'd be closing off the evolutionary potential for more than half of life. Now, uh, Aileen Christ from Virginia Polytechnic talks about the sheer moral evil of considering <laughs> what you're doing. So I'm pointing out there's another extinction elephant room which doesn't get much discussion either. And quite a few biologists are actually a bit peeved with climate change because they reckon it's taking the focus off uh, the extinction crisis, but of course climate change itself could wipe out a third of species. So they're all, they're all tied in and it's no point being, you've got to look at all of them, there's no point uh, ignoring any of them. So, but I would point out that climate change really is a symptom. It's a symptom of an endless growth myth uh, that you can keep and on a finite planet. I've never actually been in an audience where I've asked people, so do you, I've asked people, do you think the world's finite? Everyone agree with that? Mm -hmm. So on a finite planet, do you think you can keep growing forever? Well, I've never actually had anyone say yes. <laughs> yeah, they all go, or oh, do, you know, don't be silly, of course you can't. Don't the politicians think that? Well, but they don't sort of put that. <laughs> but, but of course, then I say, well, why then, as a, as a system, why do we keep going that way? And of course, they don't have an answer. But anyway, we'll come, we'll come back to that. But uh, it's also a symptom of neoliberal ideology, which is still very popular. It's being questioned more in Europe than it is in Australia. We're 10 years behind the times. Where you see the market as a god. It's also a symptom of consumer culture, which uh, really was ramped up like about 90, 95% after the end of the Second World War. Um, people were into thriftiness then, as they were in Australia. <laughs> you know, you talk to your grandmothers, or uh, well, the people in my generation who talk to our grandmothers and grandfathers, and of course they thought thrift was a great thing. <laughs> um, and uh, even now, if, uh, <coughs> if we went back to the consumption level of around 1950 or 1960, 
basically most of the world, we could get along with most of the world uh, at that level. But the point is we've become a consumer culture. Um, Eric Asadun from the World Watch Institute talks about how that was done. And over about 20 years, they managed to persuade most of America that you have to consume uh, more and more. And uh, now it's been exported all around the world. It's also this uh, problem of the symptom to a refusal to accept the Earth has limits. And it's also the general modernist worldview, which involves a lack of ethics. So uh, we don't extend the moral circle, as Peter Singer said, or our compassion. Most of the, in our society, we don't extend it outside our own species. I'd say people here probably do. But uh, Holmes Rolston, who's an environmental ethicist, points out we have to now move to an earth ethics now if we're going to solve the environmental crisis. So I showed this slide at the Fenner conference. Um, I like Wiley. Uh, who remembers Wiley Coyote in the road? Right? <laughs> OK, so there's Wiley Coyote stepping off the cliff, as he often did. Um, so in the little book that's coming out, I sort of summarized it up. Uh, I suppose I'm getting a bit fed up with things, but as believing in seven stupid things. So that the world and universe is just about us, that we're on a finite planet, but growth is praiseworthy. Uh, populations not to be considered a problem, more seen as better. Remember when we Sydney Morning Herald, when we reached seven billion, front page was, does anyone remember the title? With seven billion reasons for joy. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, endless growth in consumption of resources is not a problem. The resources, people like Julian Simon, who's still very much respected, he's passed away now, but uh, as an economist, he's very much respected by the right in society, literally said resources, uh, resource limits are in our mind. That's where they are. They're not in the real world. Uh, the idea that the invisible hand of the market is a god and must not be regulated, even though Adam Smith didn't actually believe that. <laughs> he came up with the idea of the invisible hand, but he also wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, which basically pointed out that the market is one of the most evil things around and has to be controlled. <laughs> so, um, and the idea that technocentrism, that technology can solve everything, which is uh, still very rampant. I have friends. Uh, environmental scientists in uh, the uh, Netherlands who were just telling me how dominant technocentrism is. And the idea that greed is good, even though every religious figure in the world has pointed out that it's not. Just on, on four and six, um, I've been reading a book called uh, Sapiens. And uh, this guy's Sapiens, it's the history of human, human beings. Okay. And he points out that over the time that we've all been you know, living in cities and so forth, mm -hmm. we have had uh, continuous growth and continuous consumption and continuous resource. And we've always found something new. So when we ran out of wood, we found a range of metals. We ran out of wood to burn. We have coal. We, we found aluminium. There's mm -hmm. silica now. <laughs> and the, the evidence is such that other people could say, well, we'll just find the next one. Yeah. We're well, using that's, different, that's, yes, we've run out of wood, run out of coal. Yeah, well, that's why I'm not And, and, and it, it's, it's, it's one that we need to take account of because it's, it's hard to refute that. We, have to, we can't use running out as an example for some people. We have to use something else because they'll go, there's more stuff here. We haven't used everything. Have you ever driven out the back of There's lots of dirt there. What if we find a use for dirt? Yeah. Well, it's actually very easy to refute it, but it's not very easy to get them to believe the refutation. That's what we're talking about tonight. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, there's well, history's against us as well. I say. mean, you know, even if the whole planet was just a ball of oil with a skin of rock around it, so that. You know, even even if that was the case, we would eventually run out. We're going to keep increasing exponentially. So, um, I mean, the point is, when you the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment pointed out that 60% of all the ecosystem services in the world were degrading and being used unsustainably. And when you're pointing out that the world's top biodiversity experts that half to two thirds of life is due to be extinct if we keep going that way by the end of the year, the point is. I've talked to quite a lot of preschool groups, and I've been criticised for talking about extinction, but I think they have a right to know mm -hmm. what the world is that they may be inhabiting. And I've told, I pointed out, I asked them, okay, I've talked to you for about an hour, how many species do you think went extinct while I was talking? <laughs> and they're sort of going, don't you mean like month or year or something? <laughs> and I said, no, I said, between, it's between two and ten, depending on what figures you use, and I pointed out the, the figure which is now superseded about half the world's species could go, if we keep going this way, and I, mm. I just asked them, what do you think? I wasn't going to tell them it was bad. And they were horrified. And these were the children of farmers in the Cape Valley, right? So uh, I've never met a kid who wasn't horrified about the, 
uh, if you put that to them, and yet uh, most talking to many groups in our society, they don't know those those figures. Um, so I'd say our education system has a major problem in getting. I mean, I'm coming back. I mean, we need to get the reality across of our situation, and that's very hard when the media doesn't want to get that across. Well, if, if it's true, we already need one and a half plants, mm -hmm. you know, for everybody to be able to come up to the, yeah. to the same. Yeah, we're we have to go to Mars. Then. <laughs> Doing something. All that comment. <laughs> yeah, well, um, so again, got to, got to have a joke every now and again. Um, we call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, um, <laughs> wise people. Uh, but of course, we could, in fact, because at least half of us are very prone to denial, we could call ourselves Homo denialensis because we do tend to uh, switch our attention to other things. I'm going to come back to all those sort of aspects. So, yeah, let's talk a bit about denial. Um, so, denial is very common, it's not something that's very rare. Um, Stanley Cohen was a sociologist who looked at denial of atrocities, basically, mass, mass murder. Um, and he points out it's a product of a sheer complexity of our emotional, linguistic, moral, and intellectual lives. Uh, denial forces us to confront change. We don't like confronting change. Change is often painful. Um, uh, Evia Tars Rubeville, who's another sociologist, points out that denial is inherently delusional. It distorts your sense of reality. But also many people get very upset if you point out that they're delusional. If you challenge their particular belief, uh, they will react very defensively and aggressively. And because many people do cherish the right to be an ostrich. Can you give uh, an example of that? To put their head in the sand. I'll uh, give an example of that. Well, um, because, uh, uh, well, Let's, let's look at, uh, I was lucky enough to meet um, um, Stephen Snyder, one of the world's great climatologists, uh, when he was out here only a couple of weeks before he died. Uh, he said, that, and he pointed out, uh, I asked him, are lots of other climate scientists standing up to be counted and to come out and speak up like you and you and James Hansen? And he said, no. And I said, oh, why? Why not? He said, well, uh, he said, I get death threats every week. <laughs> mm. uh, my son got one last week, he said. I said, I don't know what my son's got to do, it, <laughs> do with it. But uh, various other climate scientists have been sued. Their marriages are broken down. So in other words, if you're actually looking after your career, many climate scientists uh, are, are reluctant to stand up. And mm. because they have been uh, through when I wrote Climate Change Denial, there are various uh, denial groups. Uh, one of them actually tried to mass deluge both John Cook and I with emails, pointing out we're alarmists, except luckily they found my old email address, <laughs> the wrong email address. So. Okay. Closer to home, it was that your university put out uh, how the eastern suburbs areas would be affected by climate change, and the university was threatened by the real estate agents who didn't want people to know that whatever you know, three million or four million dollar house they bought in the eastern suburbs was likely to disappear before their time? I so mean, well, in the, the Climate Research Centre at UNSW has to have security doors that you have to get in past just mm. because of, well, they've received threats as well. So, mm. Will Stefan as well, that's Will Stefan said threats. The carbon tax yeah. is a good example of denial. <laughs> yeah, well, there's, there's all the, the media, The media yeah. ran a two year campaign mm against the carbon tax. Mm -hmm. Well, I must admit, I haven't been impressed with the ABC's coverage of Labor refusing to negotiate yeah. for reducing the mandatory renewable energy target, yeah. with the ABC saying, Labor has walked away from the <laughs> renewable energy target. I'm like, oh, you know. Well, you've got the classic now with the denial about the impact of the ABC's students and the universities and allowing people to get through universities without really having done the work. I mean, yeah, look, denial is common. It's something we do. It's, an easy, it's easier to deny things rather than to actually face up to it. And we, many of us do do that in our own lives, whether it's to do with our health or whatever else. Uh, and there's a very long history of denial. Denial of climate change is not new. It's, uh, uh, there was denial of the fact that you can't just chop up every bit of forest around the place, every bit of wilderness. Uh, this still goes on. There's a wise use movement 
in, in uh, America and there's the New South Wales government in, and the Victorian government and the federal government in Australia. Denial of population, denial of the problem of DDT, which interestingly still goes on. Um, uh, Rachel Carson has been, has been accused of being the world's greatest mass murderer by various uh, deniers, um, saying that she caused the death of untold millions and millions of people because of the ban on DDT. Now, I'm a biologist, right? If you look into why DDT was banned, it wasn't banned because of Rachel Carson, it was banned because insects evolved resistance to DDT, it was no longer effective. That's why DDT <laughs> stopped getting used. In fact, some things like the orange mite uh, had much higher hatching rates when DDT was used because it was killing it, their predators, like birds, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that still goes on. No problem with nuclear winter. Paul Ehrlich was one of the few led the pointing out the problem. Uh, most people still don't know today that even a limited nuclear war, say between India and Pakistan, could still cause nuclear winter. Um, no problem with tobacco, ask a smoker. Mm. No problem with acid rain, although, again, this is generally accepted that there is a problem. Same with the whole neosin, but the whole, uh, um, Ian Plummer, who's one of the key deniers in Australia, mm. um, has, uh, he doesn't believe the ozone hole was caused by CFCs. No problem with the biodiversity crisis. You still get uh, people telling you that forests are expanding and, and, uh, and of course, no problem with climate change. So there is a long history of denial within humanity. Uh, you'll hear different terms. Denier equals a denialist, equal in America it's a contrarian. For me, denier is simplest because I don't think you need to make up a special term for something that is so common. Uh, well, I, now, can I just comment? Yeah. Uh, Hayden, I think also we need to keep in mind that it's not just a blank emotional denial often. It's, it's a highly rationalised, a lot of marshalling of evidence supposedly and data and saying, you know, uh, this is why the people who believe mm. in climate change are wrong and so forth. So. <coughs> yeah, well, make a distinction it's, it's between really a, a marshalling of junk science. Well, that, that may be. But it's not actually peer-reviewed mainstream That may be, science. but I'm yeah. trying to suggest yeah. that if you look at it from the point of view of the person who's oh, yeah. doing it, you know, they're... Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Ian Plymer has, I don't know, 2,000 references in his book, <laughs> uh, as people point out. But if you actually... In fact, many of the people who are quoted in his book uh, have written to him pointing out that he's misquoted them and he don't, they don't mm. agree with what he says that they're saying. But yeah, look, sure, it's, um, it is hardly, look, if you, are, uh, if you are very afraid of something, you will use whatever arguments. I, I, haven't, I, don't think, I haven't covered them in this talk, but there are three main approaches to denial. One is, okay, it's just not happening. <laughs> climate isn't changing. Or, okay, yep, that climate is changing, but look, it's natural. So it's fine. Or, uh, yes, it is changing, we're causing it, but it's okay because it's actually going to be good. Now, but the thing is, they're actually mutually exclusive, but you will often find a denier using all three in the various argument about uh, denial. So, uh, but I want to I come back to scepticism because a lot of people say, oh yeah, I'm not a denier, I'm a sceptic. Well, what is a sceptic? A sceptic is a seeker after the truth. They're not running away from the truth. They're an inquirer who's not yet arrived at definite conclusions. But genuine scepticism is what all scientists have to be. Mm. Uh, it's one of the ways that scientists progress. Um, for instance, David Crowley, professor of climate change down at uh, Melbourne, or is it Monash? Monash. Monash. Monash, yeah. Um, he was a genuine skeptic about 20 years ago. He wasn't sure that humans are the main cause of what was happening. But because he was a good scientist, he did his research and realised that humans were. <laughs> so he actually uh, was a true sceptic and uh, just the same as, I forget what his name is now, and a couple of years back there was a major denier who was uh, a scientist. Is it Lombok? Oh no, God, not Lombok. He's Lombok's no scientist. No. Yeah. Lombok's a business <laughs> professor. It's only the ABC that called him a climate scientist <laughs> when he was out in Australia recently. You know, I put in a complaint for what it's worth. But, uh, <laughs> Um, the, uh, now this guy was a genuine scientist who didn't believe it, but he dug into the research for about a year or two and then came out with his conclusion that, yeah, so, well, climate change actually was happening and in fact the IPCC had underestimated 
and you can imagine how he was dropped by the various denial organisations around who had been pointing out that he'd been saying these various things. Um, so denial and scepticism are almost opposites. What about our Prime Minister? If, can I just ask you as a oh, case study oh, there for a moment? Oh, because yes. if, can we actually come back to yeah. those sort of questions yeah. at the end? Because, <laughs> I mean, if it's a question about what I'm saying in the talk now, it I'll is do actually, it now. Yeah. It's but, the definition uh, of what denial is. Yeah. Well, if you're a sceptic, you're looking for the truth. If you're a denier, you're running away from the truth that you don't like. You don't want to believe it. Uh, so, um, I mean, if you're going to talk about Tony Abbott, when has he ever sat down with the, the world's... The world top climate scientists would be quite happy to sit down with Tony Abbott and go through it if he was seeking the truth. He's never done that. Mm. Uh, they have all written to him. Uh, some of them wrote to him and every other member of parliament. Uh, we did a special edition. I've got one of them on the bench over there that went to every parliamentarian of climate change denial with, uh, how many did we end up having? About five or six of Australia's top climate scientists uh, in the front. Um, and, uh, you know, so I don't know. I don't see which of the as three, Which I'd of the three categories? Very strong denial. Which of the three categories would you put him in? Sorry? Which of the three categories would you put him in? I think, well, he tends to, uh, one, one I've seen most often the common is that it is happening, but it's natural. That's mm -hmm. the one that I've actually seen him quote, but I suspect he probably dips into some of the others as well. So just to say, okay, what's going on? A, uh, I don't think my charger is charging. Well, it's not turned on. PowerPoint. 1989, 40% of people thought climate change was being caused by humans. Uh, 2001, it dropped to less than 10%. In Australia, in 2007, it was 70 plus 5%. 2009, 56%. 2011, 46%. And we have come up a little bit since then. I'm glad to say that I haven't actually put in the figure for that. But the science all that time was getting more certain. The number of people believing it was getting less. Which doesn't seem to make sense if you think humans are actually a rational species. But let's see, ask, does society let now when I say we, I'm not saying you, but does society let denial prosper? Well, we, don't, we do have a big fear of change as, as, as homo sapiens. Uh, and if you look at conservatism, uh, it tends to be negatively related to pro-environmental attitudes. Uh, this isn't just my opinion, it's uh, the studies by sociologists over several decades. For instance, 75% of Democrats in the US believe humans cause climate change, only 19% of Republicans. Now, uh, Naomi Oreskes and uh, uh, Eric Conway wrote Merchants of Doubt, um, who point out that there's a very strong ideological view to do with the free market. The free market is seen as equated with liberty, <coughs> and environmental regulation is seen as an attack on liberty. Therefore, you have to disbelieve what the scientists and the regulators are saying. So you actually attack the science itself because you're defending liberty. So many deniers are not actually paid off by the fossil fuel industry. There's evidence that some may have been, but uh, many of them actually have this ideological belief that they are doing a good thing by protecting liberty and society, and that therefore all of us, including going back to Rachel Carson, who, <coughs> who helped to get uh, the environment movement and regulation going to tackle environmental problems, therefore have to be denigrated and attacked. Um, there's also a failure in environmental ethics. Uh, we don't tend to believe that nature has a right to exist, although there is uh, an increasing movement with Earth jurisprudence around the world. Uh, I'm glad to say there is the wild, well, it's not called it's the Earth Law Alliance in Australia that uh, I'm a member of, except it has their base mainly uh, Michelle Maloney's in Brisbane. So mm. I keep okay. seeing things for Brisbane and Perth, and <laughs> I wish they'd do have another one in Sydney. Um, and fixation on economics and society, well I'll come back to that and there's the booklet over there you can get from me later on. And of course the problem with the media. Um, a few years back a journalist, I think it was David Thorpe, released a story that uh, climate change was actually due to undersea bacteria uh, mm. releasing and it wasn't due to humans at all. And it went right around the world. The media just snapped it up, <laughs> published it everywhere. 
And after about a week, he really then released a story saying this is a hoax. And saying, why didn't you check? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. um, because the media likes controversy, it, it presents itself as balanced, but there's a whole lot of sociologists have done studies that it's balanced as bias. For other words, if you uh, have a, two people on a panel with uh, your journalist in the middle, and one of them's from a right-wing think tank who's in denial, uh, or it might even be in Plymouth as a professor at a university, uh, and the other person's uh, a climate scientist representing the view of every academy of science in the world, and 98% are climate scientists, the people watching it will think that uh, it's 50-50 yeah. <laughs> uh, undecided. Um, so the media does not, in fact, uh, the BBC now will, will refuse to do those sort of debates mm -hmm. because it's been pointed out that it is inherently biased. I'm glad to say, but sadly the ABC still does it. So types of denial. Uh, this uh, was again, mainly Stanley Cohen came up with this idea originally as a sociologist. Um, but it makes sense from a lot of the literature that there is literal denial where you just say, look, no, it's just not happening, it's not real. Um, but then there's interpretive denial, which is a bit more interesting because the facts aren't denied as such, but they're given a different interpretation. Now, we, we hear this with things like collateral damage, when you're killing civilians. Uh, we hear politicians use it all the time, and a lot of politicians use interpretive denial to do with climate change. So they give the impression that they know the path and they're walking in the right direction, but nothing actually changes. But the other one, which is even more interesting, uh, as I did my research for uh, climate change denial, heads in the sand, is implicatory denial. And that's most common in we the public, we the people, where you, people don't actually deny climate change per se, but they don't transform it into action. So they have access to the information. If you actually ask them, they'll accept it's true, yet they choose to ignore it. In, in their how they run their lives. So they don't actually do anything uh, to change it. And unfortunately, implicatory denial is very common. Um, I don't think I've put in all the white types of, no. Okay, because it was only a half hour talk, I didn't go through all the different types, but we distract ourselves, like what's happening with, uh, I don't know, the Big Brother or various chef shows that I don't watch, like what's it, My Kitchen Rules or something. Um, and what's happening with the footy, uh, or we blame it on somebody else, so we keep going along the same old way, even though we're not actually denying that climate change is happening, or we're actually not transforming it into social action, or rather, groups like you are, but much of society isn't. So, the thing is, we've got all these problems, are there actually alternatives to the path society is on? Looking at the big picture of all those various denials. And for me, of course, that's one of the frustrating aspects, because I mean, all right, I suppose if there weren't any other solutions, then I suppose we could say their denial didn't matter. But the point is there are solutions. Uh, even now, after 30 years of inaction, uh, we could still solve the environmental crisis and turn things around. Getting harder all the time, but not impossible. Um, if we break the denial dam, then things can change really quickly. Uh, of course, time is of the essence. So, again, because I'm only doing a quick talk, just a framework for solutions. Well, key thing about, if we're going to roll back to now, we've got to accept reality. And we have, to, we have to talk about it. A lot of, I've been at, for instance, I'm, where I'm going to go and visit my friend up in Elands in a few days. Last, I was up there a few years back and we got asked to dinner. And I think I said something about climate science and the, uh, the husband of the house said, oh, that's a contradiction of terms. <laughs> and I opened my mouth and suddenly all the rest of the family went, no, <laughs> we're not talking about climate change. And which I accepted because I'm in their house. <laughs> um, but the point is, that's the trouble. We do actually, uh, and that, most of us will shy away from actually when we're in that situation rather than sort of saying, okay, but I think we really do need to. Because you've got to have a dialogue. It's very hard to have a dialogue if the other person doesn't want to <laughs> have a dialogue, but we've got to keep trying. Uh, we do have to do, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the books on environmental problems never discuss worldview or ethics. Um, increasingly, that's changing. I'm very glad to say there are books on sustainability where the last third of them talks about spiritual capital, capital spiritual 
you know, spiritual intelligence, spiritual capital, things that you would never heard of even five years ago. So that is changing, and I'm very glad to see it's changing, but it has to change because in the end, climate change is not just a scientific problem. It's an ethical problem, a very, very major ethical problem. Scale is huge, but it's not hopeless. Um, somebody asked about apathy earlier on. Uh, a lot of people, the other, the other aspect is despair. Uh, people do need hope, not false hope, but they need to know that there are solutions and we could get there if we can actually push over the tipping point and uh, accept that we have a problem. I mean, you know, I wrote a book in 1991 called Eco Solutions, looking at 27 environmental problems around the world, and people would ask me uh, what was the major one that I <laughs> came up with, but of course by the time I finished writing the book I realised the major one is that we don't think we've got a problem. <laughs> and in those days, I didn't really call it denial, I put it that way. But the fact that you don't solve the problem you don't believe you have. So, um, I, you know, uh, people, there's a great quote by Joanna Macy where, because a lot of people say, are you an optimist, are you a pessimist? Now, her quote is, um, you know, people get to talk a lot about, I'm so much an optimist, I'm so much a pessimist. She said, who cares? She said, what you've got to do is accept reality and keep on loving this world more because we're not going to solve things unless we do that, unless we get that chain. Um, we're going to have to uh, move past growthism to a steady state economy. We have to go into change the growth economy. And I'm glad to say that's the hardest elephant to see. But uh, we've had uh, the first conference in Australia on it uh, on the 2nd and 3rd of October, where people were actually basically saying the emperor has no clothes. I know it's a bit different to what's happening with the G20. Up in, uh, up in Brisbane, but the point is that dialogue at least is starting, so I find that a very encouraging sign. Uh, renewables, well, we all know we could get there within two to three decades, uh, that it's actually feasible and economic, and that's actually one of the great win-win stories. On the way back from my land, the uh, day before yesterday, I stopped off at Pearson's lookout on uh, Mudgee Highway, and I was looking out over the Cape Verde Valley, and there was another guy there who has been travelling all around Australia and we got talking about, uh, he lived in Cameltown and um, he said something about, oh, you know, but what about coal? Because we got talking about, what do you think about coal? And I said, well, I think we've got to leave it all in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but what's, what's the alternative? And so we went through renewable energy. He hadn't realised that, you know, things were so close that the economics of wind was actually better than nuclear and on a par with most, with uh, coal-fired electricity or perhaps slightly better and that solar was rapidly catching up. So he found out very, you know, he's older than me to actually sort of realise that, uh, uh, that it was actually feasible and, and economic. Population, yeah, I think we have to do that. Uh, and uh, groups like Population Media have tremendous success around the world by actually getting a dialogue on it. And uh, of course, we're talking about uh, non-coercive humane strategies, which Iran in a previous incarnation, when it wasn't ruled by its current cadre, uh, was actually halved its growth rate within a few years by basically education, particularly educating uh, girls coming up to women um, and allowing them to decide when they wanted to have children. Uh, the biosphere, well, I think we have to have, uh, an ecologically sustainable biosphere it is, my other book over there is called Human Dependence on Nature. It's not negotiable. We uh, humans depend on nature. It's not the other way around. Even though you get uh, documentaries like The Human Planet that was on about a year ago, which was, uh, you know, going rah, 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 humans are so wonderful. And you can get, sadly, you even get various things in UNEP talking about humans and nature are interdependent. Well, sorry, no, it doesn't depend on us. We depend on nature. It's not that nature disappeared tomorrow, so would we. If we disappeared tomorrow, gotcha. most of nature would go, oh. <laughs> um, And creating the political will for change. Yes, well, um, that's what frustrates many environmental scientists because they know the problems are getting worse. They know we can still solve them, but the politicians in general won't listen to them. Uh, Thomas Berry, who was a wonderful theologian, uh, wrote the book, The Great Work. That was his last book, which is basically saying, the, we have faced this great challenge, the exciting challenge is the great work of preparing the earth. So in terms of your positive challenge and providing hope, 
this is uh, the exciting challenge for the future that uh, we need to embark on. And, uh, okay, I suppose I, I haven't actually gone through. Okay, city-state economy is based on two simple principles. Uh, Herman Daly and Georgescu Regan came up with the idea in the 70s is that, okay, the growth economy is clearly not sustainable. Steady state economy is one, you have a stable and sustainable population on the earth, and two, you have a stable and low throughput of resources. Now, if you can grow your GDP or your economy uh, through being more smarter and intelligent, more creative, yeah, you can still actually have an increase in GDP, but it's not just to increasing your population forever or increasing or increasing your extractive use of resources and creating more and more pollution. And that's what he called economic development as opposed to economic growth. But the fact is your GDP could still increase. Now people like uh, Ross Gittins actually is actually a fan of the steady state economy yeah. because he thinks more economists will actually support it if you're not saying that there can't be any yeah. increase in the GDP, just that it's not due to increasing population or increasing the throughput of resources, as very as Daly called it. So that's in a nutshell what steady state economy is. You can get uh, the booklet over there if you want to know more about it. I'll go to the Cassie, Cassie website. But um, interestingly, there is more and more people starting to change. There's even also the point, of course, is that uh, the major economies like ours and the US are uh, too big, so you also need degrowth. Uh, the idea of degrowth is becoming more talked about. There have been, I think, four world conferences on it now. Um, de croissance, as it's called in France. Uh, but that means that if the major economies reduce the size to some extent, that means that the developing world can still uh, grow a bit more for basic uh, humanitarian uh, reasons to reduce poverty. It means What's it that in French? So? What's it called? Uh, de, de croissance. Oh, no. Yeah. So can we roll back to normal? Yes, we can. Uh, because as many sociologists talk about, there is this trend in society towards denial or co-denial as they call it, um, and the silence of denial of unpleasant truths, but there is also a, another balancing trend also within society for people to ferret out and eventually to point the field to, to eventually say the emperor has no clothes <laughs> and that's when things can change very rapidly. So, you know, um, many environmental scientists, and I was interested actually at the recent Fenner conference, uh, how many of them, because I organised and was getting emails backwards and forwards, um, how many of them were actually basically saying that probably if you had to bet on that collapse was going to, was coming. <laughs> um, so some of them were quite uh, depressed. <laughs> But, um, and you know, I think that's the problem of being an environmental scientist. At times mm -hmm. I get a bit that way, but I don't think we should forget that the things could in fact change quite, quite quickly, where in 10 years we might look back and say, you know, it was 2015 was the year where things turned around. Um, so what's the first key step? Well, we've got to talk about reality. And you see, that's why I'm not an optimist, I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist. I think we have to accept the reality, and that's why I go around talking about what the state, when I talk to my students at UNSW, when I go through what the state of the environmental science of the world is, they all look as though they want to cut their throats <laughs> at the end of the lecture, because it's actually pretty grim. There's no way around that, but that's why I also do a, uh, a lecture on the solutions and the fact that they are there and they're quite uh, interesting and exciting and challenging. Um, but we can't just deny reality because, well, we can, but then that's why a whole lot of past civilizations went extinct. They, uh, they collapsed. But so dialogue is the enemy of denial. Does that include debate? Yeah, dialogue includes debate. Uh, it includes discussion, talking about it. But, you know, I did my PhD on, on about wilderness, which is a very conflicted term, uh, and trying to get dialogue between conservationists and I'm one, and Aboriginal people in the Blue Mountains to talk about wilderness. And it's very easy to say, yeah, I want to have dialogue, uh, but it's actually it took two years in that since instance to actually get to a point where the point is you've got to actually listen. 
mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. the other person is saying. You can't assume you know what they're going to say. Mm -hmm. And I went and interviewed a whole range of people yeah. like uh, Tim Flannery and Mike Archer and uh, Val Plumwood, the philosopher, and Deborah Verdrow, the sociologist. And, you know, most of them were assuming that they. <laughs> but when we actually got to the point where people would listen, for instance, we actually ended up having a meeting in the Blue Mountains between Aboriginal people and conservationists where nobody raised their voice, nobody walked out, and everybody thought it was great, and they found that we were 95% in agreement. But that because we respected each other, the 5% didn't matter. Why do we all have to agree <laughs> about everything? Mm -hmm. Every point, if you respect someone, you can have differences of opinion. Um, do but yeah, that we getting that debate? to a dialogue is, is critical. Can now, we debate about it? Yeah, you can debate about it, but the point is, if you get recently, a, a climate scientist who agrees with human causation and can one we who doesn't. do this at the end, thanks. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes, debate, but doesn't mean we debate it right now. Mm. <laughs> I'm mean, asking uh, you a question about the point you're making, dialogue. Yes. Yeah. So um, the problem is, is that if you're having dialogue, that's not the same as balances bias, where, whether you do with the media, whether you have one-on-one. -on -one, most climate scientists will no longer do one-on-ones with people like Bolt or Clima or what's his name? Lord Carter. Bob Carter. Um, because they realise that, uh, uh, like John Cook and I considered, should we try and get on to Andrew the Bolt report? <laughs> but we realised he's got complete control <laughs> of everything that gets said there. He can cut it. Uh, any which way, and there was no way that we could actually get uh, an even-handed mm -hmm. debate in that situation. So, yes, but I mean, why my general approach to people who are in denial, not skeptics, well, actually, let me go on because I'm actually going to come to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, accepting reality, well, you know, 1966, Kenneth Bolding talked about Spaceship Earth, that famous photo of the world, uh, brought home that we live on a finite planet. Um, we know you can't keep growing, most of us, on a finite planet. Environmental scientists certainly know that. They know the limits have been exceeded. There's a famous paper by Rockstrom et al. in 2009 that shows we've exceeded three planetary limits, climate change, biodiversity, and nitrogen pollution. But many scientists believe we've probably exceeded toxification as well, like Paul Ehrlich. Problem is we don't actually have the hard data to prove that yet. So when we say we've exceeded three limits, we may have exceeded more than three. Phosphorus is very close to the boundary. Uh, society tends to both deny this and the media tends to ignore uh, uh, the discussion of those issues. And sadly, even lately, even the ABC seems to be trending a bit that way. So accepting reality is the way in the end to solve the environmental crisis. Now, you're going to come across denial arguments. They come up all the time. When we started writing climate change denial, John Cook and I, his website, Skeptical Science, um, mm, great talk. had about 80 denial arguments on it. By the time we finished, it was about 160. So they still come out. This was actually uh, the categorization of the five sorts actually was to do with health denial, actually, uh, tobacco, uh, the paper by Dyfelm and McKee. But it basically works for almost every sort of denial. So one way is you cherry pick. You cherry pick the arguments because in science, the way science works is people put out a paper and they say something, then other scientists come back and say, hey, we think that's wrong because we found this. And then often the author of the paper will come, will do some more research and come back and say, gee, you were right, I was wrong. <laughs> but the point is, his original paper is still out there in the journals, right? So it's easy to go to journals and pit out particular papers that will question aspects of climate science. The point is many of those same people have now accepted that they were wrong in what they were saying there, but of course that's why you need to rely on the preponderance of evidence, the mainstream evidence. Uh, the other one's fake experts, like there's the famous Oregon petition which has mm. 30,000 people who are supposedly <laughs> scientists that have signed it, but in fact I think there are there are how many six or eight that actually have a degree in, in anything related to climate science, and the rest are just uh, whoever wants to sign yeah, on. Geez. 
I don't even know that they're PhDs. They're, they're degrees. They're not necessarily even PhDs. But they are the ones that they could prove they had a, a degree that was relevant to what the petition was about. Uh, the other one is impossible expectations. Science. This happened with tobacco yeah. also, mm -hmm. is that you, you say, yes, I'll believe what you say if the research can prove this, 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 and this, which, of course, is almost impossible. So that's, that's, that's another argument. A uh, very common one is the mis misrepresentations, like, well, you know, climate's changed in the past. Yes, paleo climate <laughs> scientists know that, which is why they're really worried about what's happening now. Because it has changed in the past, but for the last 8,000 years has been what's been called the Goldilocks period. That is not too hot, not too cold, just right. We have, have not had major, I know we had a little ice age, and, uh, we haven't had major climate fluctuations, which is what's happened quite commonly. And the reason paleoclimate scientists are really worried now is because the evidence that they can track down in the fossil record is the forcing of climate, that is the change that is bringing it about, was less than the way we are forcing climate now. So that's why paleoclimate scientists, they do understand that, uh, that climate change, well, the, the research is showing that the things that caused those major changes in the past in the climate in terms of the, the they do it in terms of watts per what it, cubic meter, I think. Yeah. Uh, the it, uh, this is, the research is showing that the figure that was causing the change then is lower than the figure we, we're putting into the climate now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's why, um, so pointing out that there have been climate change in the past does not mean <laughs> uh, that we're not causing climate change now. The other thing is conspiracy theories that you people, and we people love conspiracy, you can't, uh, um, and uh, you know, the suggestion that climate scientists all have their, uh, their snouts in the trough, as has been said, because uh, they're all making money out of this great fantasy that they're creating, they're just in it for the money. Um, not applied apparently to the Koch brothers or Exxon who put tens of millions of dollars into supporting denial um, organization. Because let's face it, if um, scientists like anyone else uh, tend to like fame, they tend to want to be remembered by posterity. If you as a scientist could show that climate change really wasn't being caused by human action, you would be remembered. You would be famous. You would be as famous as Albert Einstein. You really think that scientists are not doing this just so that they can stay on a salary of 80 to 100,000 or 120,000 or something in a university because they've got their snouts in the trough. Um, and the other, the other aspect of that is you're really trying to say that the thousands of people involved in the IPCC report uh, all had no ethics <laughs> or beliefs at all. But anyway, conspiracy theories are, uh, are also very common. But, okay, if you want to rebut climate change deniers, well, uh, there is no point, in my experience, sitting down with someone who is in very strong denial. I mean, the point is, if somebody knows the truth, you're not going <laughs> to shift them, unless you actually have to someone who's generally confused or who may have a strong opinion but is generally committed to dialogue and to accepting the facts. Similar to that uh, scientist who was a denial scientist, who actually did his research and came back and actually admitted he was wrong. Um, Lord Molson pointed out, I will look at any additional evidence to confirm the opinion to which I have already come. Um, there's a thing called cognitive dissonance that psychologists are talking, talking about. Now, we have the famous phrase that, um, uh, you know, that uh, we learn by our mistakes. No, we don't. Most of us don't admit we ever made any mistakes. So, uh, you have to be quite big to admit you've made mistakes. So um, uh, cognitive dissonance is the sick feeling you get when you come to realise that your cherished belief is not actually supported by reality. But when you, people are faced with that, it's much easier to go into denial and refuse to accept to believe that rather than to face that feeling. Uh, so, uh, so uh, yes, lead with positive facts that they're uh, Rather, there is, a, you know, I there is a thing called the backfire effect that if you concentrate too much on the denial arguments that have been made, what actually ends to happen after a few months is people forget 
why the denial arguments are wrong, and they just remember the denial arguments. So you need to actually focus on the positive facts and also that they're solution. You can, uh, I really, if you probably all know the Skeptical Science website, but if you don't, I really recommend it. Uh, if you do know it, uh, you're all going to leave my heart doesn't believe in climate change <laughs> or, or doesn't believe humans are causing it. But um, uh, I do recommend when you get, you know, someone send me an email saying someone, you know, when the uh, volcano in Iceland was uh, erupting and someone sent their sister an email pointing out it was releasing more carbon dioxide than the whole of humanity, well, you know, I was able to refer them to Skeptical Science website that pointed out the American Geophysical Union and all the other uh, bodies of uh, geologists who are pointing out that the opposite is true, that humans are releasing uh, more than 100 times carbon dioxide than all the volcanoes in the world. So um, it is a, a powerful tool to uh, show people. I'm probably speaking, I'm about to finish. Um, can, I say one thing also, can I say one thing about that? Yeah. Someone told me that um, because they ground all these planes, the CO2 emissions actually uh, went down during that, that volcano. Well, that may, yes. Yeah, it's I the can, flight yeah, suspensions. I, I don't know, I have to look at it, but it's quite possible. It's, it's yeah. the flight suspensions. Yeah. And the other problem is, is where yeah. planes put the CO2. Because they put it at that particular level, yeah. it's actually three times worse than if you released it at ground level mm -hmm. in terms of uh, warming, warming potential. So mm -hmm. that's why when I was doing my PhD at UWS, there was a guy who was doing it on uh, airplane travel, uh, and he pointed out that flying to London return is it has about a similar impact to driving your a small car around for ten years, mm -hmm. which is why I haven't, don't fly around. <laughs> I don't go on overseas <laughs> holidays anymore. Um, but also, often there's a thing I call the lift test. In other words, if you're getting in a lift and going up to, say, the eighth floor or something, um, and somebody mentions climate change, what can you actually get across in 30 seconds or something? You have to talk to someone. Because my experience is you either ask them, have you got an afternoon to sit down <laughs> and go through the whole thing, or you've got 30 seconds with someone. And the thing I point out is two things. One, why is it that every academy of science which are very conservative and they don't form opinions lightly. Every Academy of Science is in agreement about humans causing climate change. Why is it that 97.5% of practicing climate scientists are saying the same thing? You then, you then get people saying, oh, but that's not everyone. You never get every, anybody in science. The same as any other point of human endeavor. If you can get 98% of scientists to agree on something, you should probably listen to what they're saying. The other thing is uh, the precautionary principle. Australia is actually at major risk from climate change. We're the driest inhabited continent with the thinnest soils in the world. Um, so we could really be impacted hugely. Uh, so if you're just bringing it back to selfish concerns, <laughs> we should actually be concerned for ourselves in Australia about what's happening with climate change. So that's what you can get across in 30 seconds. Otherwise, you've got to sit down uh, for a lot longer. So you've got to see the elephants, um, but it's not just the elephant about climate change. Uh, we have to consider population, we have to consider consumerism, uh, we have to consider the way our growth economy is structured to, to change it to a, one that considers the world's limits, and of course we have to decarbonise our society rapidly through renewable energy. So in summary, denial is common, very human, but it is an illusion and it can become a pathology, especially when it threatens the ecosystems that our society is dependent on. Uh, we have to acknowledge and see the elephants in the room, because if you do confront denial, what many sociologists and psychologists will always point out with is it will decrease and shrink and disappear. So we're part of the problem, we have to be part of the solution, and in fact, um, psychologists for a safe climate, one thing I didn't say when I was talking about, their, their aspect is ask questions of someone. If you're someone with denial, one question they suggest is, okay, what would it take to change your view <laughs> about um, whether humans are causing, say you're a denial, uh, whether humans are causing climate science and get them to think about themselves, okay, well, if you could show me if this, this, this was happening, then at least you know. <laughs> you can then go and direct them to where those particular evidence can be found. Uh, so environmental crisis overall, it's not just, you know, it's not just climate, it's all the rest of it. 
it can be solved, it's not hopeless, but only if we actually turn it around and break the denial dam. So when will the dam burst? Well, that's, you know, it's going to depend in the end on all of us, but it may be closer than we, than we know. So, um, got to end with a joke. You've got to laugh, haven't you? <laughs> How you know this joke? So now we will have I don't know how long I talked for. Was that more than half an hour? Fine. I don't know if it was more than half an hour. I think we were all very interested. Um, it was half an hour, but that's fine. So we will have some um, some questions. And um, maybe the community have their hands up or who wants to start? Uh, could we sort it a little bit and first have a question sort of of just clarifications and then maybe dig mm -hmm. deeper? Would that be helpful? Any, any questions of what was not understandable? Oh. Okay. Yeah. So, what do you, how do you read the, the latest move by, by China and the United States? Oh, yeah. I think it's fascinating. Um, I mean, you know, I, have a plan later. Uh, I think it's also fascinating that Australia seems to have no, no idea of what's happening. I don't know what it says about our intelligence. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you've got to, I mean, you know, you've got to see that as a positive, that um, I, must, I, must, I must say that uh, Paul Ehrlich at the previous FENA conference, which was on population resources and climate change, was um, he basically thought the Chinese were way ahead of America in terms of understanding the reality <laughs> of climate change. And it seems, you know, and of course the head of the Communist Party in the past has made a commitment to what they call ecological civilization. You know, and you can't help wondering how much of that is spin, but um, they know they have problems, and they know that uh, you know, I think 40% of China's population relies on river flow coming from glaciers, something of that order. So, um, if you're actually going to uh, believe any of the science that their environmental science is telling them, then uh, looking to the future, they know they know they have real problems. So, yeah, I see that as as positive. Of course, it is there are aspirational goals, and um, but the fact that uh, they were actually able to have a discussion and agree on anything and to announce it at this point. Again, I think you have to see that as a positive. Well, they, so. They're the ones that saw the population issue, aren't they, in terms of their one-child policy? Sure. And, of course, there's a lot of... Uh, and at the moment, there, there's a lot of pressure uh, to weaken it. And I always find it very interesting with teaching uh, the Master's Environmental Management uh, Frameworks course at UNSW that most of uh, my students think how, how repressive China is by, <laughs> by having the one child policy and would like to see it overturned. But, um, uh, so, but again, that's part of the, the whole denial also of, uh, you know. I mean, for many decades, really, the big taboo has been you don't talk about population. Now we do talk about population and we talk, the same as denial, climate change was silence and that. We're talking about it now. What we're not talking about very much is we can't keep growing forever and we have to change the way we structure our economy uh, uh, for the future because that's actually the driver that is behind both climate change uh, and the biodiversity crisis. But at the same time, yes, I say, in fact, I don't think that the Academy of Australian Academy of Science would have given the FENA conference to Cassie and its partners even five years ago. I don't think we would have got the FENA conference grant being appointed to it. The fact that they're doing it now is because I think more and more scientists are just uh, getting increasingly worried about it and they're understanding that the driver behind it is this endless growth and we have to talk about it. So, um, yeah, look, I, you know, I think uh, uh, the, the, the reality for me is that um, while many environmental scientists are prone to depression at times, it's different from despair, <laughs> Uh, but every change you do is better than doing nothing. nothing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, and the fact that, you know, I think it's great. You've got, I hear about Paracan a fair bit from Annie and Phil, but I mean, you're clearly a fairly active, dynamic group who's doing stuff. And, you know, I think it's always great to be, <laughs> to be out uh, with such groups because that's, you know, remember what Margaret Mead said is, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Indeed, mm -hmm. it's the only thing that ever has. Because what, um, 
Well, both philosophers like uh, Eric Fromm and or was also a psychologist uh, have pointed out that in society um, there's, there's big groups who tend to feel one way or the other and but they're fairly passive about it and there's a small active group in the middle that are actually sort of pushing one way or the other and so if you can actually be a part of that active group that pushes uh, the bigger group to actually change, that's how your big changes can happen. So I know, I know look, we're stuck with the state government, which seems to see nature as a target at the moment, and the federal government, uh, we all know there, uh, you know, uh, that's, um, uh, well, we could have, it would have been nice if we didn't have to go to that stage, but it's not necessarily going to stay that way uh, forever. So. Uh, uh, and that will only change. Remember when Ronald Reagan went, got in, in the US, member, membership of environmental groups doubled right across the country, which led to a whole lot more activism. So, um, so I, would never, my, I would never say it's hopeless. Uh, people do sometimes uh, ask me, because yeah, I think there is hope, and uh, every action is, is, we take is important, because we really just don't know when, if you like, the boiling wall may topple. Mm. Could I ask another question? Um, I respect a person that stands up for what they believe in, and I look at the, um, the basis for their belief. Would you feel comfortable in an environment such as this um, to debate with another scientist who has a different point of view? Um, yeah, well, certainly I feel comfortable. Um, I'm a bit worried about time commitments. <laughs> Say next depending, year, depending where when it is. But yeah, no. I, uh, the thing is, if if we're specifically, um, I mean, I, as I say in my longer talks, I'm not a climate scientist. I'm an environmental scientist, which is the broader view. Climate scientists are the specialists. Mm. Environmental scientists, uh, the broader view. But yeah, sure, I'm happy to talk about being an environmental scientist for 40 years. I'm happy. To talk about uh, well, are you specifically talking about human causation? Is real? Hmm? I'm talking about human causation of of, the, <laughs> of the environmental crisis or just the climate crisis? Just the climate crisis. Uh -huh. I'd like to just point out that there's a, a problem with you, the way you posed that question. Yeah. You talked about belief. Belief means faith, yeah. and I think that that's that's part of the problem. You know, we need to get away. We need to have thought and scepticism, not belief. The, um, I'm trying to remember who the US Senator has pointed out that everyone's entitled to their own belief, not to their own facts. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but of course, the trouble with science is there are different interpretations of the facts. Um, let's put it, well, I notice you haven't actually said who this scientist is. Oh, but you could pick one. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some I wouldn't bother with. So that's why you I can pick them. Yeah. Uh, could, I, could I just, for those of us who don't need to have that debate, yeah. um, just set that up. So so be to me, that's yeah. interesting and irrelevant yeah. because there's enough yeah. people who want to do something about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to me, the problem we're facing is mm -hmm. as soon as you accept human behaviors causes a lot of things, forget climate, throw climate out of the way. The economic issues, the consumption of resources, the poisoning of our loss of topsoil, yeah. all that mm -hmm. stuff. <laughs> As soon as you acknowledge one of these, it's like a string connected to everything else, you know? If you decide, well, let's do something about it, go, ooh, what economy are you gonna use? Ooh, yeah. what energy are we gonna use? Yeah. Ooh, how are we gonna farm our food? Yeah. Oh, how are we gonna share our resources? Right. And to me, there's a lot of work to do. The people who don't want to engage in that, yeah. that's fine, but there's enough people that want to, and I'm, that's why Perfect Culture Sydney West works on solutions. Yeah. Teaching people how to grow food, how to conserve energy, yeah. how to change the way that they consume, yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Because irrespective of whether humans or not, it's happening. Yep. You know? There's change yes, occurring. Sure we have to be prepared for them. And to me, it's like, remember Joe Salatin, the poly farm, face farmer from North Carolina? Mm -hmm. He's, uh, he says, someone says, but Joe, don't you get tired of preaching to the choir? Because everyone that comes to his choir, he goes, mate, that's the only one to preach to. Because they're already in the room. Teach them to sing better. You know? And get them out. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I was there. wondering, yes. uh, all that rah-rah, pardon me, was to get to the question. Um, who are you connected with and what are you doing to work on solutions mm -hmm. that have to be energy alternatives and yeah. farming alternatives, stuff like that. And yeah. that, from my membership's point of view, mm -hmm. we want to help that. Yeah. We, we don't want yeah. to have the debate anymore yeah. with the data, the data's in, right? 
Uh, I couldn't go. Last uh, Saturday there actually was, I think, tank, or as they call it, of 30 people getting together to talking about uh, sustainability. And uh, uh, so, I, which, which was trying to talk about solutions, but um, the interesting thing there, uh, because my co-director of Cassie, Anna Slunky, went to it, um, and she just sent me an email reporting back on it uh, today. Um, the problem is, uh, many people who are taking action don't actually realise the breadth of the dimension. You're saying you understand there's a problem with the economy, there might be a problem with biodiversity, the problem with soil loss. Uh, an awful lot of people don't. Are, uh, in, uh, and in fact, most of the people who are at that, who, were, who came into that, you know, people like Jackie Ramon from Catholic Earth Care, who's really good on the ethics of things. I've read some of her stuff and talked to her and met her face to face. Um, but uh, they, most of the people there didn't know what the steady state economy, they didn't actually understand mm -hmm. the dimensions of mm -hmm. endless growth. So when you're talking about the choir, we have to actually at least be singing from the same page yeah. in terms of understanding the scale and the dimensions of what we're facing. Mm. Because a lot of climate activists do not necessarily recognise that it's just a symptom of these other things that are happening within society. Okay. So I think what do we have to do? Yes, well, we, you know, I have a friend who's a, 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 well, in his 70s, it's an Indian gentleman who's going back to India to set up a his um, Institute of Ecological Civilization. And his point is that if uh, with so many well-meaning people in the world, if only we could bring them <laughs> oh, yeah. all together, we could actually get change. And sure, that, that is a point, that is networking. Um, so what do I do? Well, I, one of the things I do is go out and talk, <laughs> and talk to people. But I mean, Stephen Boyden from ANU, who was the professor of the Fenner School there, he came up with a great idea that I, I, I reckon it's great, it would be really good if we actually had, is the, if we had life centres, what he calls life centres, all around, uh, like every council set up a life centre, which is like a little neighbourhood group, which is a permanent place where people come mm. to discuss mm. the sort of things yeah. we're doing, whether we're it's permaculture, uh, transform, transforming society, transition strategies, climate change. They all come here, they all have Bicycle meetings. people, uh, foodies, yeah. everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, that would actually be one institution that would be really, yeah. really positive. Um, so yeah, um, sure, I think uh, I've talked, done retreats with the Brahmu Kumaris talking in the mountains about sustainability and their beautiful place in Lura. And because they're interested in sustainability and spirituality, I also written a book called A Sense of Wonder about our relationship with nature, which I've done retreats there with it. And I think I've met quite a few faith-based, people in faith-based groups, like the Hindu society, who are really into doing things. But yeah, so we do have to bring people together. That's right. And the more, you know, I think there are, for instance, I spoke to Christians for Sustainability in Canberra on climate change a couple of years back. And uh, yeah, they had a like 120 people in a room sort of talking about it. So all those sort of groups have to be interconnected together to actually do the transition we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is, is uh, part of the problem I have is I'm also an academic, and um, many academics, there's, you anyone heard of postmodernism? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, well, many academics don't actually want to talk about a particular set of solutions because uh, every solution is equally valid except they're not. <laughs> and if you actually talk about everyone being, you actually fritter away a whole lot of energy and actually don't end up uh, pushing a particular strategy and a change, which is why my subtitle for my book coming out, The Demystifying Sustainability, is towards real solutions where there's nine key solution frameworks I put at the end. Because really, unfortunately, much of academia, I describe it as fiddling while Rome burns for the last 27 years since our Common Future Report came out. Yeah. So, um, but it, Rome, I guess I agree. Thing. At the Fenner conference, a few people said, okay, can we have a conference now on the solutions and actual case studies and histories of what people are doing around the place? Like you, like other people I know, like the Brahma Kamaris, hey, it's a great idea. And that's something I've been talking to people to try, and, whether we put it in for a Fenner conference or whether we do it another way, yeah. yeah. But because I, in my 40 years, I've found a whole lot of people approaching it from different ways that we really need to bring together. But of course, with all those things, 
One thing I've found in 40 years of activism, and I started when I, 1974 when I was 18, to do with what's now Wallamai National Park campaign, is you've got to have the enthusiasm and the energy mm. to put in, and that's what get things done. And uh, But now I'm sort of trying to target <laughs> my energy a bit more strategically, because I don't have quite as much as I used to. And in that school, you see yeah. many 18-year-olds doing the same thing that you did. Mm -hmm. Every group I go to, it's yeah. all old people. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, yeah. Where, yeah. Are, where are they? Are they Australian Youth Climate? Australian Youth Climate. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's yeah. one group with X amount of people in it, Annie. Where are your students? Yes. Where yeah. are the kids? Yes. Across the street. Well, a, lot of them, a lot of them are at the FENA conference. Because we kept yeah. the price low for the FENA conference, you could be there for $80 for both days. 40% of the people in the room were, were younger than 30. Cool. Mm -hmm. And they were so happy to be talking about uh, this issue. Um, but yeah, I agree. Uh, look, I've been, you know, every Nature Conservation Council conference has been going for years. Uh, it's, you know, the usual suspects sure. getting a bit whiter and greyer. Um, but that's started to change in the last few years, uh, last couple of years. Um, there are more pe young people coming in. A lot of people point out, I mean, Mark Diesendorf did a book in 2009 on uh, you know, climate change campaigning. Part of the thing is they don't campaign the same way. Mm. When I started, you'd go to a meeting, you'd sit down, you'd become the secretary or something, which is what happened to me with the college committee on my first meeting in five years of frantic campaign, is that most young people aren't into that, so you've got to understand the way the campaigning has changed in terms of social media. And, and yet, that again, that has been taken on. Um, but I agree, it's... But um, how has it been effective? That's what I'm asking. Um, they, may do, they may well do that, no, but, but how has it been better. effective? No, I don't think it's been effective, well, but I think it's Kick getting Act better. Kick-out change is getting a lot of things done. They're getting pretty pressure on current senators and yeah. getting, I mean, Think Act yeah. change group. They're, they're, sure. That's that generation yeah. who go, let's just start putting NIA pressure where the vote makers yeah. are, where the change makers are. Mm -hmm. So um, it, you know, let's support the yeah. people that are. Could, could yeah. I say yeah. too that a lot of young people don't like coming to meetings and yeah. just talking about things. They want That's to right. have action. So I if you go up to Moores Creek, yeah. you go up to any of these action sites, sure. and there are a lot of young people yeah. actually locking on, taking direct non-violent uh, action. Yeah. But it's the same young people over and over <laughs> again. Yeah. Oh. Oh.